Uh, I hope you can understand my accent. I have just arrived on a plane from London last night, so it's the middle of the late evening for me. Uh, so if I fall asleep in my own sermon, I apologize. <laughs> yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you. This is an important weekend. Not only is it Pentecost, not only have we heard from the amazing Sam, uh, but the Queen has had her 70th uh, re uh, year of reign. <laughs> amazing. So I I've dressed as a Union Jack uh, to, to honor her. And apparently in Canada, you love the Queen even more than we do in England. <laughs> I think you get her birthday as a public holiday. We, we don't. Anyway, it's a pleasure to be with you. And I, I was all ready for the weather. Because I, I read last year you had the hottest summer on record. And then I turn up into torrential rain. Like, what, what, what's going on? But it's, it's nice to be with you. I, I want to tell you a little bit of a story. Uh, we'll open the scriptures up together. And then I'll have a little challenge for you. And we're going to give you some thinking time. Uh, before you respond by singing a, a beautiful song that Rachel and the team have prepared for us. But let me tell you a story. So my name is Krish, which is short for Krishna. It's because my father is a Hindu, and he was born in Malaysia. But my father's father was born... Oh, is there a Malaysian person here? Yes! Brilliant. If, if, I, if I mention somewhere that you're from, feel free to cheer. So my father was born in Malaysia... Thank you. And, uh, but his dad was from Sri Lanka. Are there any Sri Lankans in the room? Yes. Father-in-law. Come on. Nice. Very good. Uh, my mother was born in India. Come on. <laughs> and as you probably guessed from looking at me, her father was from Ireland. So <laughs> I'm really quite confused where in the world I'm from. It's difficult to know who to cheer for in the Olympics. Cricket's a bit easier. Football's really simple. But I'm kind of confused. My mother actually grew up um, in India, and she had two sisters and a mum and a dad. And her dad was a crack shot with a rifle. Whenever there was a man-eating tiger marauding in the village, they would call my grandfather in, and he'd shoot it. And there are pictures of, of my mum sitting on the carcass of a dead tiger. And this wasn't a trophy killing, this was a mercy killing to protect the villagers. And uh, when he um, saw that World War II was breaking out, he signed up and he went to fight the Nazis in North Africa. He was fighting Rommel. And uh, he died providing covering fire for his troops uh, in a desert battle. And there was no one to provide covering fire for him, so he died. And he was given the second highest honor that you can get in the military, the military cross. And everyone was very proud. But the weird thing was my, my mother, her two sisters, um, because they were, we would say, dual heritage in Britain, or mixed race, maybe today. But back then, they were called half-caste, which is a horrible term. And they were deemed unacceptable from the English side of the family, and the Indian side of the family. And so they were put into orphanages, three different orphanages actually at one stage. And you're going, Chris, what, what are they doing in an orphanage? They, they have a living parent. Well, you might not know this, but 5.6 million children around the world today are in orphanages, and most of them have living parents. Most children in orphanages are not orphans. It's poverty that's the main driver, or stigma. You might have been watching the news from Ukraine there's around 100,000 kids in Ukraine that are in orphanages. They're there because of stigma around disability. Uh, parents are told, you know, you can't possibly raise a child with a disability, put them into an institution. And there's huge issues about what happens to children when they don't get to grow up in a loving family. Anyway, my mum is discovered by a grand aunt in England, in Brighton, no less. And uh, this grand aunt, begins to bring the sisters together over to the United Kingdom. And my mum decides to train as a nurse because she wants to give something back to society. And off she'd go up to the hospital and she would train. But we weren't a very multicultural society back then. And so some of the patients would say, I don't want a brown nurse to touch me. Can you ask for another nurse, please? Or some people used to throw abuse at her in the streets. They used to tell her to go black home to her own country. Aren't, aren't racists clever with their little plays on words? 
Uh, or sometimes they'd, they'd be surprised that my mother knew how to use a knife or a fork because they'd seen Jungle Book and if, I assume my mother had grown up in a jungle. So my mother decides to fight a one-woman resistance campaign to the xenophobia she was facing. Every Friday night, she would open up her lounge, she'd cook up a massive vat of curry and rice, and everyone who felt like they didn't fit in was welcome to my mother's table. All sorts of people would come. Sometimes it was the other student nurses, sometimes it was students from the universities. One was a dashing young man from Malaysia, and uh, they met each other, fell in love, got married, started having babies, and, and here we are. <laughs> so I am a product of hospitality. There you go, let me say that. <laughs> but friends, I believe that we overcome racism and xenophobia with hospitality. I think that's the Christian judo move. We take the energy of this angry, hateful, bigoted way of living, and we flip it on its head, and we welcome people to come in. Um, there you go. If you, if you need credit for that course, uh, then come for the rest of the week. Uh, but that's the big idea that we're going to be sharing in my Regent course. And if you're free on Wednesday night, we're going to be talking at the public lecture about hospitality to refugees. Uh, I'm heavily involved in the UK's response to the Ukrainian refugee crisis. But I want to show you from Scripture why hospitality is a defining feature of what it means to be a disciple. I believe you're doing a series in Matthew's Gospel looking at discipleship. So I want to show you why this is a defining feature. But before we get there, I, I need to show you an image. And, and this image causes quite a lot of, I suppose, arguments. I'm hoping we're not going to fall out. I think you all said you love the Queen. I love the Queen, so we're, we're in good, strong uh, territory here. But I'm going to show you an image. And, and do you know this image? Okay, just, just ask your neighbor, what color is the dress? Just ask them, what color is the dress on the screen? It's a bit of an echo, is that all right? You, is that normal? It is. It's okay, the room. That's, you're great. Okay. Cool. I'm fine. Yeah. What color is the dress? Okay, so th this is a user-generated photo. Someone was trying to sell a dress on Amazon, and uh, they shared it. And it nearly broke the internet, because <laughs> different people see different things. Hands up if you see white and gold. Hands up if that's you. What? Now, I know we're a non-denominational church here, <laughs> but I think if you see white and gold, you're more likely to be Anglican. Because... <laughs> Because Anglicans see kind of white dresses and gold crowns where the rest of us don't. <laughs> Hands up if you see blue or black. Yes! Excellent. Well, you might not know this, but you're probably Baptist. Because <laughs> we see blue where other people don't. No, it's, it's weird. Isn't it weird? It doesn't matter how old you are, which side of the, the, the aisle that you're sat. It doesn't really matter whether you're Anglican or Baptist. There's something going on, isn't there? Your brain is processing color differently to your neighbor. There's all sorts of theories about why that happens. Uh, I, I've met people who've given me a lecture about why this happens. The best theory I've heard so far is the different distribution of rods and cones on your retina. Apparently your brain is trying to find natural light and then working out from that what all the other colors are, but there is no natural light, so your brain is tricked. But for me, this is a little parable we're going to talk about a parable in a minute. But this is a little parable of what it means to be a Christian in the world today. You see, because of something inside you, we could talk about the work of the Spirit on Pentecost Sunday, couldn't we? Because of the work of the Spirit in your mind, in your heart, in your will. You could be sat next to a colleague at work. You're watching the same news. You're experiencing the same things in our culture, but you see something different. That's what the gospel does. It reprograms everything we are. All our dreams, all our aspirations, all our hopes, all, all our understanding of who we are and what we're for is shaped by the gospel. And I want to give you a little example of that. Next slide. This is a little boy. I'm going to call him Robert. It's not his real name. And you can't see his face because Robert is currently in foster care. And Robert has been in foster care for most of his life, actually. 
Some really difficult things happened in his family, so his mum and dad can't look after him. So he's coming to the care of strangers, foster carers. And these foster carers love him to bits, but they're not able to adopt him. But Robert is available for adoption. And, and when you adopt someone in Canada or in the UK, you go through a strict process, there's lots of vetting, and, um, and then you're allowed to see some children who are available for adoption. Now, most people that have looked at, well, to be honest, everyone to date that has looked at Robert's profile have come to a conclusion about him. Basically, he's someone else's problem. You see, Robert is five years old, and most people coming to adoption come because of infertility. We as a culture don't handle infertility well. We as churches don't handle infertility well. I, I, I've met very, very many well-meaning older people who will nudge young couples and say, when are you going to get started? And you go, well, hold on. There's stuff going on that you don't know about. This isn't helpful. Let's be kind. Let's be considerate. But when you're coming to adoption because of infertility, the main thing you want is a baby. And Robert doesn't look anything like a baby. Robert's five years old. So he's too old for most adopters. The other thing is that Robert has speech delay, which means he can't communicate in the way that he wants to sometimes. And when you can't communicate in the way that you want to at school, sometimes that works itself out as difficult to manage behavior. And that's written on Robert's profile. And so people go, oh my goodness, he's too old and he's too difficult. And so they click on to the next person. It's not quite as bad as Tinder. You don't swipe left or right, but you click on because you want another child that's more like the child of your dreams. Now, here's a little theological test. And you don't need to go to theological college to, go, uh, to have an answer. In fact, you don't even have to be a believer to guess the answers to these questions. Here's a little one. Do it with your neighbor. We'll make it competitive if you like. This side versus this side. And um, I, I want you to think of three things that the God that we've been singing to this morning, what does he see when he looks at Robert? What do you know from your understanding of the Christian faith? Maybe you've read the Bible. Maybe you want to quote some scripture at me. What is it that God sees when he looks at Robert? That's the question I want you to try and answer. And you can, I need you to come up with three things. And I'm only going to give you 90 seconds because this is speed theology. Have you heard of it? It's a bit like speed dating without the embarrassment. Hopefully without the embarrassment. Okay, and, and we're going to have a theology off between this side and this side. Are you up for this? A theology slam, dare we say. Okay, so you have 90 seconds with a neighbor. If you're sat next to a professor from a theological college, that gives you a little bit of an advantage. But three things God sees when he looks at Robert. Have a go. Oh, good. You're quick. You're done already. Uh, I'm going to call you Liverpool Football Club, and I'm going to call you Real Madrid, because uh, I'm still upset about the Champions League final. Someone over here. I'm rooting for you guys to win this, if, in case you don't know. What do you think? Give me one thing that God sees when he looks at Robert. Chosen, that's an interesting one. He, Robert feels rejected, doesn't he? That, that he knows loads of people have looked at his profile, but they don't want him. But God does want him. That's interesting. Is, 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 is Robert elect? That's a whole other kettle of fish. And I'm going to let Daryl answer that for you next week. <laughs> but I'm going with chosen. He's wanted. God wants Robert to be here. Many children were told by their parents that they are an unwanted accident. Christians don't believe that's true of any child, do we? We believe that we were fearfully and wonderfully made by God. Whatever your relationship with your mum or dad or caregivers, you are wanted here. God wants you here. He fearfully and wonderfully made you. That's a little Bible text that uh, my daughter has underneath her mirror. Isn't that an important bit, thing to know when you look in the mirror? With all the stress there is at the moment about body image and, and social media pressures and everything, to know that whatever anyone else says about you, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God wanted you here. And that's true for Robert. Brilliant. One nil to Liverpool. Come on. Have you, have you got any response? What does God see when he looks at Robert? 
child. Yes, a child. Let the children come unto me. That's interesting. Luke 18, um, the disciples decide that Jesus doesn't have time for children. And so he, he, he bans, they, they ban um, the children and the mothers from coming to Jesus. They kind of run interference if you play American football. I'm using the word football in inverted commas because it's, it's not real football. <laughs> but the rich young ruler, also in Luke 18, gets a wide open passage because he is important and powerful. But Jesus turns that up on its head, doesn't he? He says, let the children, or in the King James Version, suffer the little children, let them come. So Jesus' values are not to value the things that our culture thinks are important. God sees intrinsic value, dignity, and worth in Robert, doesn't he? Good, so should we. One all, okay, that's okay, I can cope with one all. Um, is there more? Image bearer, Imago Dei, there you go. People quoting Latin at me in this church. <laughs> that's so good, I didn't expect that. Okay, let me show you how this works. Look, I, I have a phone here, and on my phone, there's probably 3,000 pictures of my family. And if at the end of the service, if I'd got time before we fly over to North Van, um, I could show you a picture of my family. And imagine I did, and I saw your face curl up in disgust, or, or, or even worse, I, I know this is Vancouver, so it's unlikely. Imagine you were to spit on an image of my family. At one level, it doesn't matter, right? This is a Samsung Galaxy S22 Ultra. It's a waterproof phone. <laughs> no matter how bad your spit is, my phone can repel it. We're okay. Even if you did have toxic saliva that got into the middle of my phone, this is an Android phone, so I'm automatically backed up on the cloud. I'm okay, no harm done. But symbolically, you spit on the image, you're saying something about the one being imaged, aren't you? You see, this, this is why the greatest commandments are connected. Did you know that? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because what you do to the image is how you feel about the one being imaged. What you don't do or do do towards someone else made in the image of God is a reflection of how you feel about God himself. It's really powerful. It's really quite daunting and scary. It makes you stand taller, I think, as a Christian, because you think, I am made in the image of God. I, I have an incredible vocation in the world. When people look at me, they should sense something of the character of God. That's what sin is, isn't it? It's, it's failing to live up to the image of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There you go, Romans. It's an incredible honor, but it's also an incredible challenge, isn't it? that every single person that you have a touch point with in life is an opportunity to show worship to God. Brilliant, 2-1. We can call it quits. Liverpool win the day. I'm a happy man. Or do you have anything? Are you out? I've got, I've got, I've got at least one more. And I always say go for the obvious one, particularly if you're in a seminar with me, because if you say something at the beginning, then you're off the hook for the rest of this lecture, right? So just go with the easy answer. Do you think it's safe to say that God loves Robert, you up for that? Is that a theological stretch for you? You know that famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved middle class white people? <laughs> is, that, is that right? It's a different translation in England. It's for God so loved the world. Every single person on this planet is loved by God. Everyone. Everyone you're ever going to meet in your entire life is loved by God. Whether they're gay or straight, whether they're single or married, whether they're abled or disabled, black or white, young or uh, old, rich or poor, everyone is loved by God. Not everybody has responded to God's love, but everybody's loved by God. You see, the Christian faith is a package deal. A mate of mine had a sign outside his house when we lived in Albania. It said this, love me, love my dog. Right? You couldn't separate those two. If you hated his dog, you didn't love 
the guy. And if you love the guy, then you'd love his dog. That's the deal. Same package deal. Love me, love your neighbor. Are you with me? Because I love them. These are rich and profound thoughts that suddenly trigger us to say, oh my goodness, what is my responsibility to Robert? Someone made in the image of God, someone who has intrinsic value, dignity and worth because God chose them to be here, knit together in his mother's womb, um, chosen for all the creation of the earth. It's huge, isn't it? And Robert just represents one child in my country. There are 4,000 children in British Columbia um, who are in foster care. Around 700 children, just like Robert, are waiting to be adopted here in Vancouver. Now, I don't know another group of people that have a divine mandate to care for the widow and the orphan. So, friends, at the end of the service, I'm going to give you an opportunity not to adopt a child, okay? <laughs> I didn't bring my van with me to Vancouver, that would be cool. Um, and, you know, if you buy a book from me at the end, then you get a free kid. <laughs> Doesn't work like that. I'm just going to give you an opportunity to think and open up the next stage of your life to God to say, what am I supposed to do? It, do I have a response to Robert and all the other children like him here in Vancouver? But there's, the weird thing is you didn't mention something that, Rachel read for you at the beginning of the service. It was like I gave you the answer before we did the quiz. Do you remember the passage we read? Let's just spend a few moments thinking about it because it's even more profound than we thought of already. Open it up if you can, Matthew chapter 25. We'll be quick, but I can't promise you it won't be controversial. This probably is the most controversial passage that I preach on. This passage managed to, manages to annoy everybody. It annoys people that describe themselves as conservative Christians. And it also annoys people that describe themselves as progressive Christians. I didn't even check before I got here whether you describe yourself in any of those ways. Progressive, conservative, who knows. I just know this passage is going to annoy everybody at some stage. The good news is, and I'm not even that hung up about this, but don't shoot the messenger. Right? If, if you have one of those Bibles that puts the words of Jesus in red, I don't know why they do that. I believe all scripture is God-breathed, but some people think the words of Jesus deserve kind of underlining, like they're even more important than everything else. But this is all in red, right? So if, if you're in the kind of, oh, I'm not sure parts of the Bible, I don't even think there are any of those. Um, we're not there. We're right bang in the center of the red bits that Jesus has said. So again, don't shoot me, shoot the messenger. Okay, this is a picture of the end of time. This is the Son of Man. That's Jesus' favorite expression about himself. Judging the nations. This is, this is not just an in-house thing for, for Christians or, or uh, the church or the Jewish nation. This is all the nations. And he's gathered the nations before him and he separates them left from right. Like a shepherd would separate sheep from goats. This is a weird parable. Because this is depicting an actual event that is going to take place. He's giving you a, a kind of a forewarning of what it's going to be like. It's unusual. You know, the parable of the, the um, prodigal son. Was there a son that ran away from home? Probably not. Okay, that was a made-up story to help you understand a spiritual truth. This is a kind of metaphorical picture to help you understand an actual event. So it's unusual. This is kind of like the, the pinnacle. This is the last bit of Jesus' teaching before he goes to the cross. Uh, they often say that last words are important. This is Jesus ramming home to us what really matters. Now, the reason this passage manages to annoy conservatives, I wonder if you can see it. What does it look like Jesus is saying? How do you know whether you are in the kingdom of God, part of the family of God, a Christian, a follower of Jesus, someone who is saved or not. How do you know? What is the determining factor? Now, often we treat people as if it's, well, well, did you come forward at the end of a service and pray the prayer? You know, do you tithe regularly? Do you turn up at church? You know, uh, 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 can you sign a doctrinal statement that, that says the right things about God? Those are the normal indicators that people put out to know whether you're in the kingdom or not. 
what is Jesus' test of whether you're in the kingdom or not? The test is, I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me in. Do you see? Hospitality is the test. Now, you're worried now. Wait, are we a reformed church? Uh, you know, aren't we supposed to believe that we're only saved by faith alone? Is Jesus getting the gospel wrong? Some people actually told me, I wish Jesus had read a bit more Paul. <laughs> now look, I'm old school. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Nothing is wrong. All of it is right. Everything fits together. But you can't neuter or mute Jesus for the difficult bits. Let's hear his challenge. So how does this work? Look, I, I did statistics at A level. In fact, I was so bad at statistics, I managed to get zero in a statistics exam. I think that is statistically really unlikely, <laughs> and they should have given me bonus points or something. About the only thing that I can remember for studying statistics was that you mustn't confuse correlation and causation. I met some guys from the world of tech today, so you know all about maths. Correlation and causation. Let me give you an example. In Britain, we've started investing in wind farms. Have you seen those things? They're massive, great uh, windmills shaped like the Mercedes sign. I don't know how Mercedes got the deal. I mean, I'd like to have seen a BMW one. That would have been fun. But they're, they're these massive, massive wind turbines. Have you noticed that the faster that those wind turbines spin, the windier it gets? Have you noticed that? Isn't that weird? Like, next time there's a hurricane, why don't we just turn the fans off? That would be so much easier, wouldn't it? There is a correlation between wind speed and turbine speed. But if you get the causation wrong, you end up saying silly things. Now, the Bible's really clear. There is a correlation between faith and works. But if you get it wrong, you say silly things. Has anyone got a Bible? Could, could you look up Ephesians 2, 8 to 9? Can anyone do that? Oh, oh we used to play this as a game. It, it, was, it was called a sword fight. Have you heard about that? It, it, it's a really weird idea, I know, but, but because people say the Bible is the sword of the Spirit, actually Paul says that, um, if you could find the Bible verse fastest, you were the sword fighter and you would win. Chris has got it. Chris, you were the sword fighter par excellence. Come out and uh, I'm just going to ask you to read it. Yeah, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Okay, This is what Paul says about the correlation between faith and works. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. Brilliant, thank you, Chris. Round of applause, that was great. Yes. So he couldn't be clearer, could he? Paul couldn't be clearer. You are not saved by your good works. There's nothing you or I can do to make God love us more than he does already. Okay, it's all been done, covered by Jesus' death on the cross for us. That is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. But did you read verse 10? We were created in Christ Jesus to do the good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. We are not saved by our good works, but we were saved for good works. God had a plan in mind when he chose you and asked you to be his disciple, he has things he wants to be different in the world because of you. And one of those things is hospitality. Are you with me? I call it the cascade of grace. God has lavished his love and mercy and kindness and compassion on us. And now we have the privilege to lavish that on other people. And this isn't an optional extra for certain really spiritual Christians that have the gift of hospitality. You know, I've got the gift of personal consumer selfishness. That's my gift from God. <laughs> so everyone else can just go, as long as I'm singing my songs, closing my eyes, and I'm happy, then the world can just die. You know, who cares? Sorry. This is the normal Christian life. If this isn't part of our Christian life, the Bible asks us, are we even Christians at all? 
Are you with me? Now, I'm not saying everyone has to foster or adopt children, but is showing kindness and compassion to others a normal part of who you are? If it isn't, Jesus said, he might say, away from me, I never knew you. Are you with me? Do you know why this passage really annoys progressives? Do you see the last line? I mean, Jesus is dropping the H word, right? Do you call it the H-bomb? I don't know. That sounds, no, there was another H-bomb. You probably can't call it that. He mentions hell and eternal punishment. Why does Jesus do that? There's a guy in Oxford Street in London who has a megaphone. And uh, every time you cross, it's the busiest crossing in the whole of the UK, he will shout at you with his megaphone that the wages of sin is death, that you need to turn or burn, repent or perish. And, and he seems to get great delight into telling people that they're going to hell. I don't get that tonality from Jesus. Jesus is talking about hell because he loves the world. There's never been a more loving person. I told you we're foster parents. We, we've been fostering for 15 years. And uh, we've had 30 children that have lived with us. And uh, one of, uh, well, some of our foster children have lived with us just for a night because they needed somewhere safe to be for a short time until an auntie or an uncle or a grandparent can care for them. And one of our foster children has been with us for 15 years. She's still with us. And uh, we're delighted to call her our daughter. But when a new child comes into our house, I'm quite strict. And, and I, I say, look, one of the really important rules in our house is that you don't lick the electrical sockets. <laughs> Why do I have that rule? Is it because I'm trying to suppress children and scare them? No, I love them. And I want to make sure they're safe and healthy and they can flourish. So Jesus warns about heaven and hell because he wants us to know what's coming. Don't trick yourself. Don't, don't fool yourself thinking that Christianity is just about singing songs and reading the Bible. I'm sorry, no. It's about being caught up in this grace cascade into the lives of others. Let me close with a, a, a story and then uh, we'll have the band come up and then I'll call you to a response. I remember a little boy uh, who came to live with us. It, it was a complicated story. He, um, well, we, we got a call at 4.45 p.m. on a Friday evening. And if you're a foster carer, you know that's a dangerous time to answer the phone to social services because the office is going to close at 5 p.m. and they're desperate. And the call goes a little bit like this. They say, Chris and Miriam, uh, we, we know you've already got six children living with you, but, but could you possibly take another one? My wife's like in the car already as soon as they say, could you take another one, and re revving up. And I'm the kind of hesitant one going, could you, could you just tell me something about this child? And they said, well, we can't tell you much. All we can tell you is he's a biter. <laughs> Man, if you're going to tell me something, tell me something nice. <laughs> biter? Like, what does he bite? Does he bite stuff? I can cope with him biting stuff. We've got teeth marks on our furniture from cats and guests and stuff. But, but does he bite people? I mean, if he bites people, then where's he been? Is he safe? Has he been vaccinated? Like, what, what, what's going on? <laughs> anyway, my brain starts to have a conversation. The kind of, the, the bad part of my brain that doesn't go to church, doesn't read the Bible, doesn't care about the Holy Spirit, is going, look, look, you've, got, you've done enough, just, just close the door. Who cares, right? Someone else's problem. The other part of my brain that the Spirit's working on and the, and the Bible's talking to is going, hang on, bite her. That is an inadequate description of a human person. You and I, we're more than the worst thing we've ever done. When God looks at us, he doesn't just see the sin and the brokenness. He also sees someone made in his image, someone that he loves, someone that he knit together in their mother's womb. And once that part of my brain starts speaking, I've got no choice, right? So I get in the car with my wife, we drive down to the, the police station to pick him up. He was three years old. He'd had eight different families already. He had speech delay. And sometimes when you've got speech delay, biting is the only way you can tell the world that you're here and that you matter. He transformed our life. He bit loads and loads of stuff, mainly sausages, which was totally fine by me. I remember one day, 
I'd left my phone on the train. And someone at the next station had handed it in. And uh, I worked out that this little boy had never been on a train. And so he came on with me on the 1648 from Haddon and Tame Parkway to Bister North. It's an 11 minute journey. But he's standing there on the side of the station platform, jumping up with excitement. The doors open like a spaceship. Shh, we get in. It's full of people going home from being in London. They're all behind their newspapers looking very proper. They don't have bowler hats, but they could have done. <laughs> and this little boy does everything wrong. He stands on the seat. That is almost a cardinal sin in Britain. He has his nose pressed against the window and he shouts everything that he can see. Bus, tree, car, sheep, bridge, faster, faster, faster. <laughs> and I'm kind of, part of me is embarrassed looking around because we're the only ones making any noise on the train. But another part of me is excited. It's that bit that's read Zephaniah chapter 3. You know how God rejoices over us with singing? And I want to sing, because when this boy came into my house, he couldn't speak. And now I can't stop him shouting all that he can see. But I'm British, so I don't sing on the 1648. <laughs> I just nod and smile warmly. <laughs> but friends, it's an honor to be caught up in what God is doing in the world. For me, it's fostering an adoption. What is it for you? How is God asking you to open your eyes, open your heart, open your home to people that need you? The band's going to come and help us with a song, and then I'm going to call you to make, make a, um, a pledge, I guess. It could be, after the song's finished, you want to say, I want in. I, I want to be loved by God like that. I'd like to become a Christian. Brilliant. We'd love you to start your journey, even here this morning. It could be you're thinking... I wonder if our family could explore fostering an adoption. I'm not saying I'm doing it, but at least we could explore it. Or maybe God's saying to you, God, what is my vocation? We were hearing from Rwanda how boys and girls, men and women, were setting their face to be kingdom influencers in their nation. Well, why not here? Could God be calling you to be an influencer here in your neighborhood, in your company, in this country, in the politics? Thank you.